Sometimes the truth is stranger than fiction, and today I'm going to share three stories that demonstrate that. But before we get into today's stories, if you're a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious delivered in story format, then you've come to the right channel because that's all we do, and we upload three or four times every week. So if that's of interest to you, please offer the like button, a bowl of chips, and some guacamole, but replace the guacamole with wasabi. Also, please subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly uploads. All right, let's get into today's stories. So full disclosure, this is not my personal story, but in order to do this story justice, it has to be told in the first person. So I am simply an actor. I was once on a US military ship in the wardroom, which is the officer's lounge, when the operations officer came inside. This guy was the definition of not a morning person. He was bleary eyed, he kind of stumbled in. He was like a zombie holding a bagel. He sits down in front of me, he's barely conscious and he starts gnawing on his bagel and I'm sitting with my back to the outboard side of the ship. So that's the outside of the ship behind me and there's a porthole right next to my head where the sun is coming through and it's hitting this officer directly on his face. And so the officer's looking up at the sun, he's kind of squinting and blocking the sun from his face. And I'm looking at him, expecting him to shift left or right to get out of the path of the sunlight. But instead, this officer slowly reaches for the phone on the wall, he brings it up to his head, and he goes, yeah, bridge, yeah, uh, this is ops, uh, I need you to adjust our path, yeah, one, five, six, yep, yeah, that's about right, okay, all right, all right, bye. After he hangs up with the bridge, I'm watching him and he hasn't moved. He's still just looking at the sunlight blazing in on his face. He's just squinting and looking up at it. And then all of a sudden, this port of sunlight just gradually begins to shift off of him and winds up on the wall right behind him where it stops. By ordering the bridge to change the ship's path just slightly, about 15 degrees, it's enough of a change to reposition the sun from his face. He literally redirected thousands of tons of steel and hundreds of people just because he was too lazy to move left or right. I'm in awe. I can't believe he's just done this. And for a second, I worry that he won't realize how unbelievably brilliant this was. And then as I'm looking at him in between bites, he just looks up at me and smiles and goes back to eating his bagel. In November of 2006, Nintendo came out with a brand new gaming console called the Wii, and it was hugely popular and sold out almost completely right away. By the following January, it was still not on shelves in most places around the world, and so people were going crazy, spending unbelievable sums of money to try to get their hands on this system. A Sacramento, California radio station called KDND got a hold of one of these coveted systems and decided they would give it away during an on-air contest. The contest was going to to be called Hold Your Wii for a Wii. And the premise of this contest was simple. The contestants would be given lots of water and the person who held it the longest, i.e. they didn't urinate, would win the prize. Leading up to this contest, the radio station began promoting it really aggressively on air and lots of people called in with concerns saying that drinking too much water can actually be deadly. But the station brushed these concerns off and said they were aware of them and that all contestants would be signing a waiver and so ultimately the station was not responsible for what happened to them. On the morning of Friday, January 12th, 18 contestants showed up at the KDND radio station and they signed their waivers, although one of the contestants said the waiver only covered publicity issues, not health and safety concerns. One of the contestants was 28-year-old Jennifer Strange, who was a mother of three, and she was trying to win this Wii for her kids. She, along with the others, after signing their waiver, were ushered into this room where they were handed eight ounce water bottles. Every 15 minutes, they would be expected to finish that water bottle and then refill it and do it every 15 minutes. And if at any point they didn't completely finish their water bottle in time, or if they got up to use the bathroom, they would lose the contest. The contest started at 6.45 a.m. And by 8 a.m., after five bottles had been drank, a number of the contestants began pulling themselves out to use the bathroom. But the radio staff felt like this contest was gonna take a really long time. And so they gave the remaining contestants that included Jennifer a larger bottle of water to drink from. Over the next several hours, 
hours, all of the contestants, except for Jennifer and one other, had dropped out because it was just too painful. They had to go to the bathroom. Jennifer was heard on air saying it hurt so much. And one of the hosts laughed and said, well, do you need to lay down? And then somebody piped up and said, she can't even walk. And so everybody just kind of laughed and did nothing about it. Around this time, a nurse called into the radio station and very emphatically said what they were doing. This contest was a really bad idea. You're going to get someone killed from water intoxication. Water intoxication is also known as water poisoning. And in a nutshell, what happens is when you drink too much water, the water dilutes your bloodstream. It can cause swelling in your brain and it can lead to coma and or death. The host, after hearing this concern, turned and yelled to the remaining contestants, hey, is anybody dying out there? And then the host just kind of laughed and hung up on the nurse. A little while later, you can hear one of the hosts on air comment on how Jennifer's belly looked really strange. It had become totally distended and bloated, and they said it looked like she was pregnant. At some point, Jennifer and the other remaining contestant began vomiting, but instead of dropping out, they just continued to drink more water and did not go to the bathroom. But finally, it became too much for Jennifer to bear, and she dropped out of the contest and she relieved herself. For coming in second place, she received tickets to a Justin Timberlake concert. On her drive home, Jennifer began experiencing this horrific headache to the point where she was just sobbing uncontrollably. Through tears, she called one of her coworkers and said she just was not gonna be able to come into work that day. Her head hurt too much. And so after she hung up, her coworker she had just spoken to was really concerned about her and called Jennifer's mother to let her know what was going on. And about an hour later, Jennifer's mother headed over to Jennifer's house to check on her, and she found Jennifer dead in her bathroom from water poisoning. The station was ultimately sued by Jennifer's family, and they were ordered to pay over $16 million in damages. In 2005, 57-year-old Steven Slevin was a physically healthy man, but mentally he was struggling. He was depressed and felt like his life didn't have any purpose anymore. And so in August of that year, he decided to just go on a road trip. He didn't know where he was going. He just felt like if I get out on the road and just go driving somewhere, I will feel better. And on this road trip, he eventually began drinking alcohol. And before long, he was swerving along the New Mexico highway and a police officer saw his erratic driving and pulled him over. Once Stephen failed his sobriety test, the police officer arrested him. Stephen was brought to a local detention center where during his booking process, it was discovered that he had a history of mental illness. And so the officers following that county's policy segregated him from the rest of the general population in an effort to protect Stephen from himself. They moved him into a padded cell on the first floor. They removed all of his clothing and they put him in what's called a suicide smock, which looks like a big blanket wrapped around your upper body. And what it does is it keeps inmates warm and modest, but it also prevents them from bawling up their clothes and creating a noose they could hurt themselves with. After a few days in this padded cell, Stephen was moved to another better cell that had a window, it had a shower, it had a toilet, and he was there for two weeks under strict medical observation. But at the end of those two weeks, for reasons that are not entirely clear, Stephen, this mentally unstable man, was moved into solitary confinement to await trial for his DWI. Solitary confinement is a type of imprisonment where the inmate is shifted into a single person cell and they are kept there nearly around the clock without any significant interaction with other people or other inmates. The psychological effects of solitary confinement are well documented and terrifying. Just 15 days into solitary can be enough to cause permanent psychological damage. Stephen's first few weeks in solitary were actually okay. He was allowed to write to his family. He was able to detox and reflect on his life. During those first few weeks, it was noted that Stephen was very polite in his very limited interaction with the officers that were dropping food off through the slot in his door. Also, when Stephen had a few minor medical issues, instead of throwing a fit, he just knocked on the inside of his door and waited patiently for someone to acknowledge him, which took a long time, but he never got frustrated or mad. But by January of 2006, so roughly three months into his solitary stint, Stephen had not had any updates on when his case was going to go to trial, and Stephen was starting to lose his grip on reality. He was having these severe panic attacks, and he was suffering from intense hallucinations. He desperately wanted to find out how much longer he was going to be kept in the cell, but nobody would tell him. He tried writing his letters to his family, asking for help or asking them to try to get an update on his case. But when he went to 
literally write the letter, his hand shook so severely from the stress and anxiety that he literally couldn't write these letters. Starting that January, Stephen began spending the bulk of his day in the corner of his cell with his knees tucked up to his chest, rocking back and forth. He was allowed out of his cell a few times a month, but in April of that year, that stopped and he almost never left his cell again. And without leaving his cell, Stephen was unable to bathe. And so his skin began developing fungus and began falling off and his teeth began to rot. Finally, on May 8th, 2007, so one year and eight months of being in solitary confinement, Stephen was transferred out of his cell to a behavioral institute in Las Vegas, Nevada. After bathing and shaving and cutting his hair and receiving proper medical treatment, he was back to his normal state within a couple of days. And while he was there, he had a chance to speak to a lawyer and the lawyer would say the entire meeting, Stephen was just saying, where have I been? And the lawyer said, you know, you've been in solitary confinement awaiting trial. You've been there for almost two years. And to that, Stephen was shocked and literally didn't believe him. He actually couldn't remember that time in his life. It was like it had driven him crazy and he had completely repressed it from his memory. But when the lawyer told him about it, it began to come back into his mind and he begged the lawyer to not let them send him back to solitary confinement. And his lawyer said, unfortunately, if that's where they're gonna keep you, that's where they're gonna keep you until you have your trial for this deal. DWI, and unfortunately, we have no idea when that trial is going to be. But stay strong because it's bound to be soon if they've already transferred you to this institute. Stephen stayed at this institute for two weeks, and during that time, he asked constantly about when his trial was going to happen, but nobody knew. And at the end of those two weeks, Stephen was abruptly taken out of his room, put in a van, driven back to New Mexico, and put back into his solitary confinement cell. And immediately, Stephen began to deteriorate, and he begged the guards to not put him in the cell, but nobody was listening. And before long, the door had shut and he was all alone again. Within a couple of days, Stephen developed an abscess in one of his teeth and he tried to get medical attention, but he didn't get it. And so he sat in the corner of a cell and for eight hours one day, he rocked back and forth and violently twisted and yanked and pulled on that tooth until he was able to rip it out of his head. Almost two months later on June 22nd, 2007, Stephen's case was finally put before a judge and the judge dismissed all of the charges. It's believed the judge found out about this horrible mistreatment of Stephen and took pity on him, but we'll never know. Three days later, Stephen was released from jail and reunited with his family. He had been in solitary confinement for two years without so much as a hearing to tell him what was going on. He had essentially been forgotten about. He would go on to sue the county and win $15.5 million in damages. However, at the same time he's winning this case, he was diagnosed with terminal lung cancer and given less than a year to live. It's unclear if he is alive today. So that's gonna do it, guys. If you found the secret in today's episode, let us know in the comments what it is and where you found it, so give us the timestamp. And if you're the first to do that, we will pin you at the top of the comments section. If you got something out of today's episode and you haven't done this already, please offer the like button some chips and guacamole, but replace the guacamole with wasabi. Also, please subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly three or four video uploads. If you wanna get in touch with me, you can direct message me on Instagram or on Twitter. My username for both platforms is the same. It's John Ballin 416 I also have a ton of content over on TikTok where my username is Mr. Ballin. I also have a second YouTube channel called Mr. Ballin Shorts where I post short random videos and lost episodes. If you have a story suggestion, please submit it to our subreddit just called Mr. Ballin. It's linked in the description below. So whether I see you on Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, Reddit, YouTube, or some combination, just know that I really appreciate your support. And until next time, that's going to do it. See ya.